Did you ever think that Jeffrey could have been like um, possessed? And trying to get Jeff to understand that that it was it was a salvation by grace and not a salvation by works. What well, was a hard thing for him to understand? Um, you said that you believe that he was sincere in his conversion, correct? Right, let's go ahead and start off with the phone call. So when you got a phone call that you'd be baptized in Jeffrey Dahmer, what was kind of like your initial thoughts? I got a call from a fellow minister who had gotten a call from uh, Curtis Booth down in Oklahoma. He was one of two people who saw uh, the Stone Phillips interview of Jeff and where they'd pressed about his evil urges and so forth. And said, if anyone needs to hear about Jesus, uh, he does. And so uh, Mary Mott and Curtis Booth were both making phone calls and Curtis finally succeeded in reaching Rob McRae in Milwaukee, who then called me because I was closer to the prison. Okay. So uh, he said, so when an inmate wants to be baptized, would you be willing to do it? I said, sure. Oh, well, that's the prisoner's name. He said, you might want to sit down for this. It's Jeffrey Dahmer. Well, I'd heard of Jeffrey Dahmer. He'd been in the news, of course. I didn't know as much about the grisly details at that point in time, but I knew something about Jeff. And so my initial thought was, okay, uh, why does he want to be baptized? What does he even know about baptism? What's he thinking about? What's he expecting? What's, what's going on here? And of course, those are questions I just didn't have answers to until I had a chance to actually talk to him. But that was my initial thought was, okay, that's curious. Why does he want to be baptized? I had no idea because uh, baptism is such a controversial subject theologically. Right. Uh, people think all kinds of different things. And so I didn't know quite where he was coming from, what his, what his viewpoint was or why would you even ask? So right. those are questions that I had to ask when I got to them. Okay, and um, when you did hear about kind of grisly details, did they kind of worry you a little bit? Or was there one particular one or anything that kind of just stuck out to you that kind of really made you uncomfortable? Or When I first met Jeff, I really didn't know much about the details at all. And I would meet him several times. And then my wife said, you really ought to find out more about his story. So I went to the local library and checked out about a half dozen books, one including his father's book of things that Jeff had done, things about Jeff and so forth, and read through them all. And when I got done, I told Jeff I'd read books about him, and Jeff, Jeff got kind of nervous and said, Why, what, what do you think about that? And I said, well, it looks to me like none of them knew you very well. And then, I'm sorry to say, include your father. None of them really spent time listening to you. They all just reacted to the things that, that were done, and then they drew the conclusions and so forth. Uh, but when you get to actually know the person, it's a different sort of setting. Uh, Jeff came across to me as kind of mild and very courteous and very polite and, and considerate, which is not what I was expecting of a yeah. murderer. I, I was expecting something kind of rough or tough or trying to push their way or be bullying or something like that. No, he was not that way at all. He was very, very considerate, very, uh, very quiet and willing, willing to do anything and or talk with me about anything he wanted to talk about. So when I read the very, the various details, I became more familiar with the grisliness of it all. But by then I'd gotten to know him, and so I was able to kind of say, okay, well, that's in your past. We're in the now, so let's deal with what we've got right now as opposed to what, what, what was in the past. One of my philosophies about dealing with people is that your past explains how you got here, but where we go from here is sometimes a different story. Yeah. What, what, where we go from here is it's a big question. And so you can sometimes say, well, my past rules, my past controls me. Well, that's one attitude. Or you can say, well, my past is my past, and I'm not going to continue doing that anymore. I'm a changed person. Uh, in my line of work, I have to believe that people can change. Most people don't believe people can change, but in my line of work, I have to believe people can change because that's what ministry is really all about. One thing that's kind of worrisome, I want to say, about Jeffrey is that he didn't seem insane. So it's like when I think of somebody that's insane, they seem to be out of touch with reality. They're not really aware of what they've done. They're not worried. Um, they're not aware of how the impact that they had on others. But Jeff didn't seem that way. Um, did you kind of get that from him as well, too? Is that like he seemed pretty sane? I didn't. I never had the sense that he was out of his mind or insane in that, in that sense there. I remember talking with a psychologist in my congregation, uh, and, and she told me about how they had studied the question of his, his insanity and had decided he was sane. And of course, the question of how could he, how could he be sane? Well, they thought he was sane because he tried to hide his crimes. Uh, if you were insane, you wouldn't really know, wouldn't really care and so forth. Uh, Jeff came across to me as someone who, who was very cognizant, very much aware of what's going on and, and was, was uh, at the point I knew him, somewhat remorseful of the things he had done. It, it, I like to describe it from my point of view as 
sometimes we lose our mind. And when we've lost our mind, we don't know we've lost our mind. Yeah. And so we're doing things we think make sense to us. And we come back to our senses only when we start asking ourselves the question, why did I do that? What was the matter with me? I, that's not like me. When you reach that point, then you finally come back to your senses. Uh, to me, it's like the particle sun coming to his senses uh, after he finally wishing he could eat what the pigs are eating. And he's so, uh, so uh, uh, scandalized by that thought, he has to force himself to say, well, th- what am I doing here? This, is, this doesn't make any sense. Uh, what can I do? And the only thing he could do is to go back to his father, which, which, does, which is the right thing to do. But at the time, it wouldn't have made sense. It wouldn't have been out of his mind. And I like to think that Jeff had gotten out of his mind by losing his focus in terms of what was really important. He described himself as an evolutionist and as an atheist when he committed his crimes. Later on, his father would send him anti-evolution material, which Jeff read and which caused Jeff to turn around and begin to believe. And once you once you begin to believe in God, it changes your perspective on everything. Right. And so once his perspective began to change, he began to see things and began to ask himself, what's the matter with me? Why did I do those things? He, he would even say at the end of his trial, he, he, he not, now saw himself as sick. That what he said himself. Yeah. Well, he's, he's diagnosing himself. He sees that there's something wrong with what he was doing. But he didn't know it at the time he was going through all of that. To him, it was just, this is the thing we do. This, this is what, this, uh, what's fun. Now, or this is, mm. he, he justifies it. He saying animals eat animals. and says we're all animals. Then there's nothing wrong with that and, and that kind of stuff. So uh, I, I like to, I, I realize I'm being somewhat merciful by saying that, but I think he, he lost his mind when he came back to his senses. Then he began to say, oh, uh, uh, I've got to make changes. One of his first murders, he described himself as blacking out and not being aware of what happened. He woke up and he found um, the guy that he was with dead next to him. And he concluded that he must have um, beat the guy to death. Um, and there was also reports of the guy that escaped at the end when they finally caught him. That guy said that um, Jeffrey was um, seemed pretty normal. Then all of a sudden he switched into... Um, being the guy said, um, it was like confronting Satan himself. Now, given um, that we're both in this kind of um, sphere where we're aware of like um, demonic activity and that sort of thing, did you ever think that Jeffrey could have been like um, possessed in a sense by some sort of demons or something like that? No, that never occurred to me. And it, it never really occurred to Jeff either, e- even though he did have a altar of skulls. So somewhat, some people kind of draw, uh, read into that, some kind of demonic worship, something like that. No, he didn't believe in the God or, or spirits or anything like that at the time he was committing his crimes. And when we were talking together, I never got the sense that he felt that he had been demon possessed. I mean, that, that just simply wasn't on the table as far as he was concerned. Uh, the, the, the first one you described was the second murder that occurs in Milwaukee where he, he blacks out from alcohol. And when he wakes, when he wakes up, the guy is dead. So he, he assumes he must have killed. He doesn't know. He just assumes that. So he, he cuts that body apart and hides it in a suitcase. And, and throws it in a dumpster. And that, that body's never found, so he's not charged with, with that murder, even though he confesses to it. Uh, the, the last guy, he, we were going through a series of murders. At the very end, he, he's murdering very quickly, one after another, so he's practically stepping over himself and so forth. So uh, the guy's beginning to get away, so Jeff becomes very threatening at, at the time. You could say, well, he switched. Well, he switched from, I, I'm luring you into my... You know, to now you're trying to escape, so we, we've got to change our, our mode of operations. So I wouldn't say necessarily it was demonic. I just say it's his personality. Now, with the Netflix series, have you seen the last episode where they portrayed him being baptized? I have not seen any of the Netflix series at all, although when I was interviewed last week, the interviewer showed me a clip of the baptism itself. Yeah. So I saw a little bit of that, and, and okay, I, I appreciate her showing that to me. It's a little bit different than what I experienced in that in that scene they show him being baptized, body full back and so forth. Whereas in the, the tub that he was actually in it was so small, he had to lie in a fetal position. So he was all scrunched up with his knees up to his chest and so forth. That's because he couldn't squeeze in any other way. And he, he was on his side, he was looking up out of the water. So it just his head was out of the water. And then I I spoke the baptism for him, I baptized in the name of the Father, Son, and pushed his head under the water. And then we came up, then I said to him, Welcome to the family of God. And that's about as far as my experience with in the clip. Yeah. The guy who got the he got who portrays me, he grabs his shoulder and says, You're saved. You know? <laughs> well, that's not exactly what I did at all. I mean, that, to me that was obvious. That that's what we're, we were trying to accomplish in, in the whole point of the baptism. So I didn't have to tell him something that we already knew. 
So th- those are a couple little things. But I realized yeah. they were dramatizing things. So, right. okay, fine. Gotcha. Yeah. And so when it comes to the baptism, after he came out of the water, um, what kind of sense did you get from him? Did he seem appreciative? Did he seem shocked? Did he seem emotional? Like what was kind of sense that you got after he was baptized? I think he was more relieved than anything else. I think he felt a great deal of remorse and and to some degree he felt uh, condemned because of the things he had done. And so the, the world had condemned him already. I mean, everything he heard about him was, was, was condemnation and so forth. And this was an attempt to get back to God. Uh, at his memorial service, uh, I quoted a passage from uh, a book by Max Licato, where he talked about a, t- a Bible school teacher talking to her class. And there's a little girl that would never speak, and she finally talked to, talked to him about heaven. And the little girl speaks at the end saying, it's heaven for little girls like me. And I interjected by saying, Jeff was a boy standing outside the classroom looking in, hearing the story, and he dares to ask the question, is heaven for little boys like me? And for many people, that is that angers them that he would even ask the question because they already know the answer is, well, yes, heaven is exactly for little boys like you. They don't want to hear that answer because they don't want to hear him ask the question in the first place. But that's really that really summed up, in my mind, what was going on with Jeff. Uh, is heaven for me? Can I, can I possibly be saved from terrible things that I've done? And the answer was, yes, you can. Definitely. Um, one of the questions that um, I've seen the most on the video that I recently did on him was people wanting to know if you saw a change in Jeffrey as after the baptism and as he kind of progressed, did you kind of notice a change in his kind of way of thinking and his behavior? And what was that kind of process like? I believe there was a change in his in his behavior. Uh, not that I noticed so much, but more than uh, his father wrote an addendum to his book. At the end of his book, he wrote an addendum saying that he noticed a change in Jeff, that Jeff looked at people differently than he did before, that Jeff was treating people differently than he was before, which I attributed to uh, this change in his, his way of thinking and so forth. Um, as far as Jeff and myself was concerned, he, we were only talking with each other, and uh, he, he became concerned about his mother who had lost her faith. How could he get her to get her faith back? And how could he then share his faith with other inmates? So those were changes that probably were important that, that weren't, weren't there before, but I hadn't seen bef- the before. I only saw the after, so to me, I know there was a change, but I didn't really see it so much. That's right, yeah. And um, you said that you believe that he was sincere in his conversion, correct? I believe he was very sincere, yes. Yeah. And what, what kind of makes you think that he was sincere? I often tell this story about the question of sincerity. After he had been baptized uh, a, a few uh, time, a few weeks after he had been baptized, he mentioned to me or confided in me that he felt he should have been put to death because of the crimes he had committed. To which I responded by saying, yes, I agree. You probably should have been put to death for those crimes. Living in Wisconsin, which doesn't have doesn't apply the uh, death penalty, then he, 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 receives, he receives mercy instead of justice is what it comes down to. So his response was, well, then if that's the case, now that I'm a Christian, am I sinning by living? Which implies, should I uh, kill myself or should I arrange myself to be killed by someone else? Something along those lines. And of course, he waits till the very end when the guard says, you got to leave now. So we had to wait till next week to really address that question. But we spent time looking at Romans chapter 13 and the role of the state and, and the, the agency of, of justice. The, 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 the people of the state are to God. They, they bear a sword. They don't bear it in vain, that kind of stuff. And what are you to do? Well, you are to respond. You are to submit to the governing authorities. So uh, I said, in this state, they've laid their sword down and they picked up a rod. So they're going to beat you with the rod to suffer, but they're not going to kill you with a sword, and you need to, res- you need to simply submit. And then we end up going back to 2 Corinthians 5, where it uh, talks about Jesus died for all, and therefore all died. And those who live no longer live for themselves, but for him who died on their behalf. So now your responsibility, Jeff, is to live for the one who died for you. That's what it comes down to. And so that pretty much drove any suicide uh, thoughts uh, out of his head, it, uh, that, that he... His focus has got to be off of himself and on to what he can do to, to serve is what it came down to. But as you went to go see him every Wednesday, what was kind of the things that you guys kind of talked about that you were kind of focused on? Was it um, kind of going through like a lot of scripture, helping him understand Jesus? Or what was kind of like a lot of the stuff that he was curious about more? My intention was to introduce him to Jesus in the sense that I liked, I wanted to start with the book of John and just work through the, the things. But he, he was more interested in little details of 
he came from uh, an understanding of scriptures was somewhat legalistic. So he was he wanted to make sure he got everything right. So he, he argued with me about the baptismal formula. Is it do you say in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, or do you say in the name of Jesus? And that's all you say because in the book of Acts it says they were baptized in the name of Jesus. So he spent some time talking about that. Uh, he wanted to argue about what translation of the Bible to 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 read. He wanted to find out uh, how he could take communion because in our faith you take communion every Sunday. But they didn't offer it every Sunday. So how, how could he do that? He was worried about the use of instrumental music because in our faith, they don't use instrumental music in the worship service. So little details like that as, as you go through the, the process. And most of the time, it's a matter of my saying, well, we're in prison. Prison isn't designed to be a church, so you can't do everything you would like to do in a church. So you just got to do the best you can with what, with what you've got going there. We finally ended up uh, agreeing that I would use the NIV translation. He would use the King James because that's what he was comfortable with. And if there were any dis, dis, uh, problems, we would just kind of work those things out as as we went. But we spent a great deal of time arguing about uh, which which Greek uh, uh, text you had to rely upon, the one that was the base for the new, for the King James one for, for later ones and so forth. And fortunately, I had done some study in this, so I knew a little bit of what I was talking about. Uh, but we spent a lot of time dealing with that kind of stuff. Uh, then he was worried about the uh, the European Union that, that they were coming together you know, at that time, and he was worried about that was going to be uh, the time at the end. And I said, well, "No, I, I didn't think that that's what I'm talking about." He alluded to the the statue in Daniel chapter two about the, that you know the the gold head and the silver and so forth, and that it was going to be destroyed. And I said, "Well, I don't think that's talking about the European Union at all. I think that's talking about the rise of the church." And so he then alluded to the book of Revelation and, and thought it was talking about the end of the world. I said, I, I don't think it's talking about that either. I, I, I try to explain it. It's mostly a struggle between the church and the Roman Empire. So he wanted to find out more about that. So he wanted to do a study of the book of Revelation. And I insisted, no, first of all, we studied the book of Hebrews because the book of Hebrews gives you keys that help you unlock doors in the book of Revelation. So we started our way through the book of Hebrews. And then we were working our way through Revelation when he was murdered. We got about the halfway through Revelation. Uh, the last time that I saw him, uh, but mostly we, we were satisfying his curiosity about end time things, uh, uh, pre-millennial viewpoints, and things of this nature. That, that was what he was kind of struggling with because he had well, all he knew basically is what he'd seen on television. He really hadn't had spent much time in church. Gotcha. Okay, that's good. Now, um, what do you do with some of the dis discrepancies? So I know that there were some discrepancies before he died in terms of, um, I think it was like they said that he was taunting. Um, the inmates and the prison guards and that sort of thing. Um, did that kind of make sense to you? And even I saw in your book too, at the end where you said he had letters um, to women or something that you didn't know about as well. Did any of that kind of make you doubt his sincerity of his faith? Or um, do you think that that was just part of, um, you know, his old, the old man, you know, um, his old kind of nature kind of kicking in or what are your kind of thoughts around that? I was surprised about the women. There were about a half dozen women who had contacted me after his death who'd been writing him and thought they were in love with him and so forth. Of course, uh, that's kind of preposterous since he claimed to be a homosexual, but but you have this kind of thing going on where he, he's responding to people who are writing to him, so he's, he's responding back to them in, in a way that, that is, is as loving as he possi possibly can. Uh, I didn't realize until after the Christopher Scarver interview uh, uh, about a decade ago where uh, one of Christopher's uh, excuses for killing Jeff was that he, he played with his food like he was a cannibal and so forth. And it occurred to me, because uh, we had a gentleman in the congregation where I was preaching who had what I would call a goofball persona. That is, he would wear funny clothes and he'd cross his eyes and would say the f silliest things. And when you're around him for a short time, you say, well, he's just a goofball. Yeah. But then you sit down next to him and, and he starts talking and you're amazed at how wise he is and how smart he is and how, and you begin to think, well, that's just a, a, a a facade he puts on to protect himself. And it occurs to me that Jeff was doing the same thing, only with the cannibal persona. He he, he portrayed himself as a cannibal in uh, an attempt to attract attention on the one hand, and at the same time to say, stay away from me. And so he could say to a guard, I bite. Yeah. See how we can sh shake the guard, or he can hang up a sign in his cell saying, cannibals anonymous meeting tonight. You know, that kind of stuff. So he toyed with the idea of being a cannibal uh, quite a bit. I think it was because he, I think essentially, he didn't trust people. Yeah. There are a lot of people who claim to have been his friends, but they, the friendship they had was they were entertained by him being drunk or being an idiot or being a fool. 
but none of them really sat down and talked with him personally, but he didn't have a close friend. And, and so I think at the end, uh, the last time I saw him, he gave me a, a card, a Thanksgiving Day card saying, thank you for being my, basically my friend. And I think I'm really the first or one of the few friends he actually ever had in life because he didn't really know, he didn't really trust people at all. What do you think about those who say that Jeffrey Dahmer was too far beyond grace to be saved? Well, a person that asked that question doesn't really understand grace. Uh, the fellow who called me about Jeff, he was a preacher in Milwaukee. He made a comment to me. He said, this story about Jeff kind of stretches our concept of grace. When I first heard about that, I thought, well, okay, I guess so. But then the more I thought about it, the more I came back and said, no, it doesn't stretch your concept. If it stretches your concept of grace, then your concept needs to be stretched because it fits perfectly into the concept of grace the Bible describes uh, about. Uh, and so anyone who says there, there's not enough grace, you just don't understand what grace is to even say that idea at all. Uh, we have a hard time comprehending the forgiveness of God. We like to play God so much that we want to judge on God's behalf. And sometimes we accuse God of not judging as harshly as we would like to judge. That, that, that's how ridiculous that we are. So we really have a hard time comprehending God's willingness to forgive and God's willingness to understand uh, a person when a person comes back to God, a person changes from God. Um, it's hard to really imagine. Uh, well, I'm trying to think of the, the Hezekiah's son, the Bible. He filled the streets with blood and said, you know, it's... Uh, uh, and yet in the Chronicles, he changes and comes back to God. How is that possible? He's so evil. How is that? Well, God is a forgiving God. We have a hard time comprehending that God can forgive. Yeah. We just don't comprehend the heart of God at all. And that's our problem. Uh, we, we, we play God so much that we just can't comprehend what God really is all about. That's right. Yeah. And I, I, I mentioned in my recent video on this, I thought about the fact that like it does sound really offensive to think that somebody like Jeffrey Dahmer could be in heaven. Um, but I think it's offensive because in some ways we think that we would be more deserving of heaven than somebody else. But in reality, we're all equally set apart from God, you know what I mean? The same distance. And so um, I guess my question with this is some people have mentioned that um, it's uncomfortable to think that Jeffrey Dahmer could be in heaven while some of his victims could possibly have not accepted Jesus and been in hell. Um, and that makes a lot of people uncomfortable. It is an uncomfortable thought. Um, do you have any kind of thoughts on on how to kind of think about that or kind of approach that sort of objection? Yeah, it's because we have the wrong focus on how what it takes to get to heaven. You know, uh, Jesus said, I didn't, uh, anyone who believes on me, you know, can, can be saved. Anyone who doesn't believe, I mean, that, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a line right there. It's belief or not, not belief. Is what it is. So we, we think in terms of you've got to earn your way to heaven or, or you've got to be good enough to get to heaven and so forth. It has nothing to do with being good. I mean, it, you, you ought to be good, and you will be good if you believe, but you don't get there because you're good. You get there because you believe. That's right. right. And, and, and if you're a good person but you don't believe, you're still not going to get there because the issue is, is about belief. It's not about being good. That's right. and, so that, and so our focus gets to be on earning it ourselves, and, and, and you can't earn it. You, there's nothing you can do to earn salvation or to earn heaven. It's, it's, it's an act of grace or an act of gift of God. Absolutely. And... Um, so as Jeffrey kind of wrestled with this kind of idea of like a works kind of base salvation, trying to do all of the right things in order to have salvation, how were you kind of able to kind of show him that it's by grace through faith? Yeah, that was the issue. That, that was the main thing I was trying to focus on with him is to help him see that it's not a, like a legalistic, it's not a matter of earning or uh, making, uh, doing so much law, you know, keeping, he was worried about doing things right. You know, why, why is the baptismal form so important? I want to get it right. I've done things wrong all my life. Well, it isn't so much a matter of doing the right as is a question of your heart. That really comes down to, and so God looks upon your heart. And that that's really what what, what it's all about. Uh, it's easy to look at a story in the Old Testament, like Leviticus sent Nadab and Abihu. They offered strange fire, <laughs> but at the end of the chapter, you find, or no, early later in the chapter, you find that when God gives an answer to Aaron, why they were burnt, it wasn't because they offered strange fire. It's because they were drunk. They were inebriated. Is what. So you don't approach God. Uh, in that that attitude, you got to show respect to God. At the end of the chapter, then Aaron's other sons offer sacrifice, and they make mistakes. Just because you make mistakes doesn't kill you. And trying to get you have to understand that that it was it was a salvation by grace and not a salvation by works. What was a hard thing for him to understand? When you think of Jeffrey today, and then you think about how he was, how he's kind of stated and shown in the media and that sort of thing too. And what's kind of one of the biggest kind of discrepancies that you kind of see? Like the Jeffrey that you knew 
compared to the Jeffrey that society knows and from the media and that sort of thing. Every, every story I've ever seen on Jeff uh, is almost always a focus on his crimes and, and the things that he did to people and what, what, it would, what kind of person it would have to be to do those sorts of things. And, and, and uh, I don't know how accurate that is because I didn't know that part of Jeff. By the time I come on the scene, Jeff has already changed a little bit. He's, he's already uh, repented of things that he's done in the past. And he's, he's asking himself, why did I do these things and how can I uh, undo them? So he, by the time I meet Jeff, he's already a little bit of a changed man and we try to help him change even further along the way. And so uh, to me, when I see stories like that, I just, well, I, I don't pay much attention to them. I say, okay, well, that's a story you want to tell. That Go ahead and tell your story. You know, if it's Halloween or whatever you want to do, you, you, you scare us, okay, you have a scary story and, and go along with it as much as you want to. It, it's ironic to me that on the day Jeff was baptized, John Wayne Gacy, who was a murderer from Chicago, was put to death on that same day. And so it's kind of ironic that one man dies to sin, another man dies in life on the very same day. You ever worried that um, you could have possibly been deceived by Jeffrey, where he was a false convert and you didn't know? In hindsight, did you, that ever kind of cross your mind, or did you kind of always kind of feel like you had a good understanding, I mean, a decent understanding, the best understanding that a human could have um, as to where he was in his faith journey? I've been accused of being uh, fooled by Jeff or, or being conned by Jeff because Jeff was a con man, mostly by uh, people quoting the victim's families saying that because that's that's how they see him because they're wounded, they hurt, and they, and they don't really, they, they're unwilling to see Jeff in, in any other way. They can't see him differently. I never saw Jeff that way. And when you actually get to know the story, you, you see it differently. Uh, and to illustrate, at the memorial service, Lionel shows up with a a sister of one of Jeff's victims. She's there. She's gotten a, a, a relationship with, with Lionel and his wife. So and she brings along her sister, but doesn't tell her sister what they're there for. They're there at, at a memorial service for the man who killed their brother. So she's sitting at the back of the auditorium, tears running down her face while we're doing this thing about Jeff at the, at the front of the auditorium and so forth. And I feel really bad because her sister had deceived her in a way to, 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 to get to look at these sort of things. At the end of the service, I then walked up to her and said, I'm very sorry you know, what happened to your brother and so forth. And I'm sorry that your sister deceived you about this thing and, and you know, th that this was a, a thing for Jeff. She said, well, I was very angry at first, she said, but then when I heard you guys tell the story about how much Jeff had changed and how much he believed in God, it's easier for me to forgive him now because I believe you actually did believe in God. So when you actually hear the story and you begin to understand the story, you have a different view of, of what it's really all about. But if you stand from a distance and judge, it's easy, it's easy to judge someone from a distance and say, well, you're rotten, you're no good, you're terrible, and you don't, you don't deserve anything at all. But if you can actually get a close to a person and see them, you see a, a different story. Uh, for me, the prison ministry in general, beginning with Jeff, but, but through the years, has been to realize that the people I'm dealing with are still people even though they've, they've done some terrible things or foolish things in most of the case, they're still people. They still got the same fears and the same dreads and the same hopes and the same dreams that everyone else has got. They just, they, just, they just got off track somehow. And so you're trying to help them get on track a little bit by putting their faith in God. Good. Um, when you heard about Jeffrey's death, how did that kind of impact you? And how, what was kind of your first reaction? And then what were your kind of thoughts following his death? I heard about it on the radio. We had gone to the grocery store and the announcement on the radio said that Jeffrey Dahmer had died. And at first, my, my initial reaction was, well, I think they've made a mistake or they've got the wrong guy, that sort of stuff like that. Because, because I, 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 when, they, when there had been an attempt on his life earlier in July, uh, there were some issues that were wrong, that they had gotten wrong. So I thought, well, they got things wrong too. But then I realized, well, obviously they know who Jeffrey Dahmer is and they, they know what life and death is, so he's obviously dead. And I knew then at, at that time that uh, because I'd been inundated or, or baptized with media because of his baptism, I knew I'd have a similar thing because of his death because they would want to come back to me. So I had to go home and change into a more ministerial looking outfit, you know, and, and, and then uh, and I was getting calls. So, so I'll meet you at my office at the church. And, and the people then interviewing me and, and, and viewing, and, you know, photographing me and things of that nature at, at that time. So I spent... That whole afternoon, that whole day, the rest of that day, dealing with with his death and dealing with with people who were asking me questions, and then getting calls from the women who had uh, 
thought they were in love with him. And now it was just a, it was just a, a crazy period of time. And I didn't really have a chance to grieve his death, uh, except in the sense of talking about it with others. That, that allowed me to kind of get it out of my system and so forth. So, so uh, I know there's a People magazine came and they have a picture of me holding up this uh, 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 Thanksgiving Day card that they got. And you can see my face and I'm sad. But at the same time, I realized when I look at it that I'm working through my grief at the time. I'm doing it publicly instead of just privately. Are you aware of anybody, um, Jeffrey, um, giving the gospel to somebody that's accepted it? Or has anybody um, that you're aware of converted given his um, situation and given his conversion and death? I don't know of anybody that, that uh, Jeff himself reached for, 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 for the gospel. I know he, he wanted to, and he made attempts to work. I've had many people approach me since then who have been moved by the story. And, and, and because of what happened to Jeff, they have changed, made changes in their lives as well. The thinking was, if, if Jeff can be saved, then I can be saved because I'm not quite as bad as Jeff. That, that sort of stuff like that. Uh, sometimes when people ask me why I wrote the book that I wrote about the story, I, I often will say, well, regardless of what you've done, there's going to come a time when you're going to feel as bad about yourself as Jeff felt about himself. And you're going to put yourself into a deep hole. You're going to feel like you can't get out of that hole. And the story, Jeff's story, is that there's a hand that can reach down and grab you and pull you out, and that hand is of God. He can pull you out of the hole no matter how deep a hole you may be in. There's always a way of getting out of the hole because if you hold on to the hand of God. And so that's what the whole story Jeff is really all about. And I think it reaches people today. It, it amazes me that years have gone by and people still respond to the story of, of Jeffrey Dahmer. And it's not that he killed more people than anyone else or he did anything worse. I mean, yeah, what he did was gross, what was terrible and so forth. But the concept that uh, uh, one who would do such terrible things could then turn to God and, and, and seem to have some sense of, of, of relying upon God that touches people because they begin to say, well, if he can do it, then I can do it. If God can save him, then God can save me too. I mean, that, and I think that's a very, very, important, very important point. Uh, uh, Rob McGray, who called me uh, about Jeff in the first place, had told me that they had been studying this passage in Timothy. Uh, in 1 Timothy, where Timothy says, uh, where Paul says to himself, I am the worst of sinners. And he asked the question, this is in Milwaukee, who do you think would be the worst of sinners today? And of course, once you get past the Hitlers and the Stalin, it's Milwaukee. They're going to say Jeffrey Dahmer, of course. It's what it, so he was sharing that with me. And uh, I uh, had a visiting minister passing by, and I shared that story with him. And the, and the guy said, I disagree. He says, I don't, think, I don't think Paul would agree with that. Paul would not say Jeff is the worst of sinners. Paul would say he's still the worst of sinners. I said, why do you say that? He said, because Paul would see that, that Jeff... Jeff didn't have the kind of upbringing Paul had. Paul had studied under great rabbis. Paul had served God with an honest heart. Jeff was just killing people, just you know, whoever he saw. So, so, so he would consider that Paul's crimes are worse than Jeff's crimes. And so I shared that with Jeff, and I, I, I told him about this story and this concept that, that uh, Paul would still be considered the worst of sinners, not Jeff. And just, well, I think I'm the worst of sinners. And I said, I think you're just grossed up by your sins. And he kind of said, well, that's probably true, too. Yeah, but, but I really think that really captures a lot of what it's all about. Uh, Paul's point in his epistles was, if God can save me, then God can save you. And that's a simply the same story with Jeffrey Dahmer. Absolutely. And Jeffrey, you would consider your friend, right? He was your friend, right? And do you believe you'll see him in heaven one day? I believe so. I believe, uh, I, I believe in going to heaven, and I believe that he's there, and I believe I'll see him in heaven. That I, I hope to, anyway, see him in heaven. Like I hope to see other relatives and friendlies and friend, you know, that 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 I've known in this life. I'm 75 years old now, so I've known a lot of people that have lived and a lot of people that have died, and so uh, and, and there's a lot of people that I've grieved uh, over the loss and so forth. And so there, then there, and many of them I think did believe, and so I I hope to see them very much. So and I believe that would be true of Jeff as well. As well. Well, Roy, thanks so much. I mean, thank you for having this interview. Thank you for giving the gospel to. Um, Jeffrey Dahmer and not seeing him as too far beyond salvation because I believe that just like how you believe that nobody is too far gone for God to save and nobody's sins are too great that God can't cover them. So thank you for all that you've done. And um, thanks. I thought that was pretty good. Was there anything that you wanted to include or anything that we didn't touch before we 
No, I think we've pretty much covered everything. Okay. It's, it's hard. I mean, I could go on for hours and hours yeah. depending upon what you want to talk about and so forth on right. the subject because it's like I say, it's vivid in my mind. It's something that's just it's very much there. I don't have to study notes and kind of put right. Yeah, yeah. I, yeah. I, I know this stuff because it's part of my experience and so forth. So yeah, yeah. That's well, great, man. Um, also, I'm, it's my uh, reacting to whatever questions you ask. You. Oh, well, that makes me think about this. And there we go with that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Well, see, I, I think it's so great how God uses people too, because even on my video about it too, like a lot of people were saying how they were crying because of the story and stuff, and just how deep God's grace is. So, like, think how much glory comes to God even through these awful situations that we find ourselves in. You know, so I think it's it's great that God's use you in such a good way and which you i'm sure you didn't expect you know what i mean no i didn't expect it yeah and i think it's it's cr really critical at this time in our nation's history anyway perhaps in the history of the world because it seems the faith is, has been deteriorated or lost so much people uh, don't have as much faith at least as i can recall in the last in the years that I, i've been alive and so I'd like to see people return to faith or come back to faith. And, and this is one story that kind of helps along that line in a way that I, I really believe a, a lot of the problems we have in our nation is because of a lack of faith, which lends itself to foolishness, foolish decisions and so forth. Yeah. And so that, that's, that's part of the problem I think we're suffering with now. Um, was there anything in your friendship or in your conversations with Jeffrey and your interactions with him that you kind of regret that you either said and wish you didn't say or that you didn't get to say i don't really regret anything during the time i had with jeff after his after his death i did have a regret uh, i wondered if i had done any everything i could to prepare him for him to meet his maker i didn't know it, that he you know would be who would die quite as soon i thought we had lot, lots of time and so forth uh, but I, I really felt that no, I did the best that I could do at the time and that God would understand what, what, that, I, that I, I, I did what I could do. But there's part of me that kind of felt like I wish I wish we could have talked about other things, you know, that some things. We, we, I, I was limited to what he wanted to talk about as opposed to what I really felt like he needed to hear about. It, that, that was that was probably the only thing I, 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 I regretted. But that was mostly after his death yeah. that I felt that, you know, now I've lost the time to do that. The man that killed him. Um, Christopher Scarver, Scarver, yeah. yeah. Um, do you believe that Christopher Scarver could also be forgiven of his crimes? And do you know of anything of him um, kind of like feeling bad about it or anything like that? Because I understand his situation was a little strange too. I, I read reports that he said he believed that Jeffrey was fake and he believed that God wanted him to kill Jeffrey. Is that correct? I'd heard that this morning that that, that, that was one of the excuses he gave was God wanted him to kill uh, uh, Jeff. Um, I, I don't know what to think about Christopher Scarver. I, I, I feel like he was a little bit schizophrenic or not able to, to come to terms with reality. So a little bit of what he would say would be a little bit off course. Uh, it, it's really hard to say, is he able to be forgiven? Of course he's able to be forgiven. Uh, there's no question about that. But he's got to have faith in God. But I don't know what the story with him is at all. I've never had a chance to meet him or, get, or talk to him or, or get to know him at all. So I, I can't really say much about him other than from a distance and it's easy to judge from a distance as, as i mentioned earlier and i'm not going to judge so uh, and last question i just thought um if you could say something to the family who um, lost their loved ones due to jeffrey's crimes um what would you like for them to kind of understand or know either about jeffrey or about the situation when it comes to the forgiveness of somebody like jeffrey i think i'd probably uh, like them to know that Jeff, like they, have lost their minds and their times when they've done things that they shouldn't have done. And some things you do, you can't undo, you know, which is what the case with Jeff. But at the same time, we all answer to God, so we all turn to God, try to have something to deal with God, and God judges fairly. Uh, it, we're a little bit startled in the story of Judges, uh, not Judges, uh, Daniel, where a hand shows up and writes on the wall, and the basic message of the wall is, you've been weighed and found wanting. Ooh, well, we're all weighed, and we're all found wanting to some degree, you know. Okay, so what are you going to do about that? Well, there, you, you, there, God has not been silent on what you can do about your situation. You, you, there's, there are answers. Uh, and, and the story of the Lazarus and the rich man, send Lazarus back to tell my brothers don't, not to come here. They already got, they've got Moses and they've got the prophets. In our day and time, the answer is they've got Jesus and they've got the apostles. Uh, God's already given you the path. All you got to do is spend some time reading and dealing with what God has already given you. Uh, I like the, the question God asked to uh, Moses. 
uh, when he's telling Moses to go uh, uh, rescue uh, Israel, he says, what do you have in your hand? Well, I have a staff. Right? Well, God's going to throw the staff down and become the snake. I'm going to use this to convince Pharaoh. God's already put in your hand all you need It is the point. And so I would say that to the family as well, that God has, God has given you all you need. All you need to do is turn to God. And God can, God can heal. God, God is a great, God is a God of all comfort. So God can comfort you in your grief. And God is the one who can forgive not only Jeff, but God can forgive you too. So that would be a message I would say as well. Do you feel like you could have forgiven somebody if they did to your family what Jeffrey did to their family? I would like to think so. It's hard to really say because I haven't been there. So I don't really know. Uh, we, we often measure forgiveness by how intensely we've been hurt. You don't know how bad I hurt, therefore I don't, it's harder for me to forgive. Well, Jesus was hanging on a cross with nails in his hands, and he's saying of the people who crucified him, they don't know what they're doing. You know, for God, he asked God to forgive them because they don't know. Well, that's pretty, that's pretty intense pain, and yet uh, he's able to say, I can forgive. And, and Jesus basically says, I want you to do what I have done. So, and Jesus doesn't ask us to do things that it's impossible for us to do. So if he can do it and, we, then, and he expects us to do it, then we can do it as well too. Um, but the next time that somebody thinks that their sins are too great for God to forgive, what are you going to say? Uh, what do you mean? 